You are listening to Dove Valley Deep Divers with Eric Trickle and Lance Sanderson. Ball comes out of the hands of Newton. It's on the ground, picked up by T.J. Ward at the four-yard line. Vaughn Miller did it again. On Overtime Media. And we are live. Mile high hello, everybody in Broncos country, and welcome into another episode of the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. My name is Lance Sanderson. I am your host, as always, and joining me, as usual, is my good friend and colleague. He is your Denver Broncos insider and the senior NFL draft analyst for milehighhuddle.com. He is the one and only Eric Trickle. Now, Eric, this week is kind of fun, man. It's combine time, and, you know, last night I got an opportunity to watch these quarterbacks, the, the tight ends and wide receivers, did a couple of articles late last night. What do you think, man? How are you doing, and what, what's your biggest takeaway from the combine so far? Man, I, I love this time of year. The combine is you, that time where you always get to see those people that freak out and overreact to the numbers that they're putting up. But it's all about adding context to what you're seeing on tape, putting the numbers to it, and just all that. It's not just taking the combine and what, at face value. It's all the added stuff that comes with it. And, man, some of these 40s times, I think the most impressive for me, I mean, everybody's talking about Henry Ruggs. But Tristan Wirfs and Mackay Becton have probably been the most impressive workouts overall for me. Man, seeing those guys move at that size, I mean, 486 official 40 for Tristan Wirfs, tremendous. Mackay Becton, what was it, 405 40 officially, I think is what it was. 506, I can't remember what it was officially. But at 364 pounds running that fast, man. That's that's about 100 pounds more than me, and I don't think I could probably get close to that. I'd probably be about three more seconds running a 40-yard dash in that. But, man, a lot of guys standing out. Denzel Mims, Justin Jefferson. We're going to be talking about receivers here today, so I don't want to spend too much time on them. But just got to admit that I am a little bit di- disappointed in Jalen Rager. Hopefully his pro day, he provides a little bit better numbers and just helps himself a little bit because he didn't do that at the Combine. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, today we are going to have a coach on. He's a good friend of mine. He's a good friend of Mala Heddles. He's been, he actually used to uh, be the co host with Chad Jensen on the Locked On Broncos way back when and just be just tremendous with us. And he has a long history with the, with Mala Heddle and everybody here. And uh, going to be bringing him in today. His name is Luke Poglaze. He is currently the coach, wide receiver coach at Kenyon College. Very excited to have you on talking about receivers. How's it going today, Luke? It's going great, Eric. I appreciate you guys having me on. I'm excited to, to talk some football, excited to kind of get back into the Broncos community a little bit and, and kind of talk some ball here. Yeah, and so uh, we had you doing – well, I actually asked you to go and break down a couple of the receivers that we have with the Bron- that are being linked with the Broncos. And, of course, they're the, they're the – top guys in the class. I mean, CeeDee Lamb, Jerry Judy, Henry Ruggs, Jalen Rager, and all these other guys. And uh, so just just before we get into talking about the receivers specific, more in depth, just kind of give me an oversight of what your thoughts are on these receivers that you watched. Yeah, I mean, I think first of all, you, I, I haven't really had a chance to follow much of the draft, but I think kind of the, the consensus I've heard floating around from folks is that this is a tremendously deep draft for wide receiver talent, which, you know, especially with the NFL's kind of overall direction towards being more of a passing oriented league, you know, everyone's always looking for quality quarterback play. Well, I think it's just as important to look for quality receiver play. Um, so when you have a draft that's this deep for, for receiver, um, it's always exciting to kind of see where some of these guys are going to be, you know, a year from now, five years from now, all that. Um, so, you know, for from the five guys I looked at, I was pretty impressed by all of them, you know, for varying reasons. And, you know, I'm excited to get to chat a little bit kind of more in depth with you about them. Yeah. So with the combine underway, you being a receiver coach and – now, we were talking about this before we went live, and you're kind of making jokes about how there's a big difference between Division One and your own level. So obviously there's a huge difference between NFL and the level you're coaching at. But with your experience that you have coaching receivers, what would be from the combine of the drills they do, what is that one thing that you'd really be looking for with these receivers? Yeah. Well, and it's not even that it's just the combine. I mean, if you look at the overall recruiting process from high school, if you go to any kind of prospect camp, you know, a lot of these guys are going to be doing pretty similar drills. Um, So, you know, obviously everybody always talks about the 40 and, you know, kind of for for having athletes with speed. I think wide receiver is one of those positions where people kind of stereotype the 40 as being really important, which it is, you know, because – 
you know, a four seven guy is already going to always going to be outpaced by a four three guy in a straight line. But you introduce pads, you introduce, you know, grabbing and holding and all that good <laughs> stuff. And, uh, you know, that's not always the case. So, um, you know, I think the 40s, 40 is important to an extent. Um, you look at your kind of your broad jumps, um, obviously, just to kind of measure any kind of explosiveness um, is great because when you're when you're playing receiver, you know, the guy who's who's the fastest may not necessarily top a guy who's more explosive. Right. Um, you know, you want to be able to get a guy who can kind of explode off the line and threaten D, uh, the DBs vertically. Um, obviously, vertical leap is important for for vol- uh, for a wide receiver. Um, you know, I know that the term is kind of in use now these days to, to moss somebody. But, you know, it's 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 a thing, right? You know, to go up and moss somebody, to go up and take a, a towering catch over someone else. You know, the vertical leaps part of that. And, you know, I think any any drill really at the combine is important. But I think you got to also mention the three cone um, just for measuring kind of, you know, hips again, kind of explosiveness. And just, you know, I think that translates really closely to route running. Yeah, that, that obviously makes a lot of sense. So. The one big thing, the one big receiver, I know I had you watch him a little bit, and we were talking about him last night, and that's Jalen Rager, and you came away pretty impressed with him. So what are are some of your thoughts about him? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I kind of, for me, you know, I'm not necessarily as versed these days in in the draft or necessarily where these guys are going to rank, you know, at the end of the day or – you know, I, I'm not going to be, you know, a well-versed enough to tell you, oh, take this guy in such and such a round. I'll leave that to the draft experts like you. But, you know, what I am happy to do is to kind of talk about where I see, you know, these guys, what their kind of primary skill sets being. I think what they'll bring to an offense and kind of where they'll really, really win at the in the NFL. Um, and with, with Rager, he's like the first thing I wrote down is he's, he's special with the ball in his hands. You know, he's a playmaker in open space. Um, and, you know, he's one of those guys who is an offensive coordinator. Maybe you just kind to have that little box on the side of your play calling chart and you just have like five or six plays that are just how do I get the ball to this guy because he's explosive right you want you want guys like that to touch the ball you want them to have a certain number of touches per game um, you know I think one thing that he does really well um, he's he's a really great route runner he's kind of really refined his technique um, one thing you'll kind of talk about sometimes with wide receivers is for lack of a better term I call it airplaning right which is when when a wide receiver if he's going to run a post right he's got low pads and then the kind of the closer he gets to that break point he kind of gets higher and higher up in his in his stance basically or in his um in his run in his kind of jog posture um and so you know you'll kind of see these wide receivers and it it, it kind of tips the db off right because they get to anticipate that a little bit that if he's kind of slowly getting taller in his in his posture right you're expecting some kind of change of direction one thing with him is he's got a really consistent pad level he's really fluid that he's just here and bang he's a stick to the post or bang stick to the corner or anything like that so i think his his overall pad level is really consistent which is i think really makes him um, difficult to read as a route runner Um, and i think it's going to be something that translates really well for him immediately at the next level yeah before we get to this i just want to say thank you brian greenfield for your for your donation. Very much appreciate that. CD Lime is the number one receiver. I definitely agree there. He's my number one receiver. You're scared that Ruggs is a bust. I can get that. I like Ruggs a little bit, a um, little bit less than other people do, but I'm still a fan of his. Maybe he is a bust. I'm not so sure. Obviously, time will tell with that. Now, with going back to Jalen Rager, I got to ask, With you mentioned the three cone and the concern with the route running with that. Jalen Rager kind of ran a little bit of a slower three cone with a 7-3-1 uh, three cone. So, how concerned are you about that with that when you compare that to what you see on tape? Well, yeah. And I think you kind of look at some of his other numbers, right? Like he ran much slower in the 40 than certainly I was expecting. Um, And I think that partially goes back to, you know, guys don't always run, you know, on a, on a straight line on the field with no pads on versus how they do in a game and game speed is a term. And it's, it's a thing like guys perform differently at game speed. Um, but, you know, I, I, one thing I really was really kind of impressed with him was just his releases. Um, you know, he's spent a lot of time, it's pretty evident, like on his releases on how he gets off the ball. Um, and, you know, I didn't see at him try anything in college that he wasn't, you know, athletic enough to do. Like he wasn't kind of overstepping his bounds. He was playing really well, I thought, kind of within his boundaries. Um, and I think that that's something that's going to really set him up well for success uh, at the next level. All right. And last question about Jalen Rager is obviously can't talk about him and not mention this. He had seven drops. Most of them are concentration concentration drops at the college level this just this last season. So as a coach, 
what would you be doing to try to get Jalen Rager basically cut those concentration drops out of his game? Boy, if you could, if you could put, uh, you know, uh, if you could distill getting rid of the drops down <laughs> into a bottle, every wide receiver <laughs> coach in America would be lining up for that. Um, you know, for me, and you know, it's it's something that obviously even at my level, especially at my level, you know, guys will struggle with drops. You know, that's the nature of the game for any kind of receiver. Um, I think for me, it just comes down to you know being comfortable. A lot of guys will just kind of try and snatch the ball out of the air. Um, you know, my kind of coaching point for that is just to have soft hands. Um, I know a lot of guys will will do they'll kind of just do muscle memory exercises where they'll just have guys, you know, when you're standing, you know, eating your cereal in the morning or you're like standing, making dinner or something like that. Just have guys go, you know, here, 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 and just have them like actually walk through the muscle memory of putting their hands in those places so that they get, you know, to kind of have that experience. Now, you know, obviously, you know, having drops is an issue that TCU was more than likely aware of and you know it's something that they'll have coached him on and it's something that the nfl will have a plan in place to develop for him uh, now didn't ask you to watch this guy but i have to men- bring him up since you're a colorado buffalo alum lavisca chanel just give us a quick breakdown of your thoughts about him yeah well i mean i'm, I'm a buffs alum and you know from what i've seen of the games i've been really impressed you know he's been he's been an explosive receiver for them and you know, for a program that's starting to kind of create some real receiver talent. Um, I think a lot of credit has to be given to their receivers coach, you know, coach Darren Ciparini, like he's done some great work developing guys over the last couple of years, you know, Chanel, um, Tony, is it Tony Brown? Who's in the draft this year? Um, Juwan Winfrey last year, he's got some really great talent to work with, but he's done a great job of molding them. Um, And I think Chanel kind of takes that mold and he pushes the envelope a little bit further to the extent that, you know, Colorado has in the past has used him and just line him up at wildcat quarterback, right? You know, he's got, he's got such a remarkable skill set. He can go up and attack the ball uh, in the air. You know, he, he's great. He's another kind of one of those guys. You kind of just want to have a little block on your play calling chart of ways I can get this guy, the ball. Um, You know, I think he's someone who you can use in a lot of different roles. And I think he's going to, I think he's going to have a lot of success at the next level. All right, and of course with LaVisca Chenault, when you're talking about him, he's missed a lot of time with injuries. And right now mm-hmm. at the Combine, he's dealing with a groin injury. He ran a 4-5-something. I can't remember off the top of my head what the full number was. And then he didn't run a second time because of the groin injury. So with the amount of time he's missed, how concerned are you with that going forward? Yeah, and you know, especially when you're at, when you're in college and you can't stay healthy, I think that's an issue. Um, But, you know, uh, you kind of hope that, you know, maybe NFL teams have, you know, they've done their background work, they've done their homework on physicals and all that, and, you know, that they have a plan in place for for a guy and that they want to be able to keep him on the field. Um, You know, at the end of the day, I think, you know, a a guy like that, you know, maybe he's not a first round risk, but I think at a certain point, the talent is going to be there and you kind of roll the dice. You know, does the fact that this field is deeper at wide receiver in this year's draft maybe hurt that? Yeah, probably it maybe does that you'll kind of take a shot on a guy who maybe his ceiling isn't there in terms of talent, but he has a higher floor because he can he can be on the field, right? That he doesn't deal with injuries. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. And uh, so good into the next receiver. You're telling me before we went live that what as a receiver coach, one of the things that you went and did was you went and watched Joe Brady and the LSU offense. So obviously you got a lot of time to watch Justin Jefferson. And I know from our private conversations that you're a big fan of Clyde Edwards Hilaire, which yeah. makes me smile because I'm such a fanboy of his. So getting to Justin Jefferson, since we're focusing in on the receivers, just what are some thoughts that you have about him? Yeah. And, I, you know, LSU as an offense specifically is so it's so versatile. Um, and, you know, they were able to basically line up with the same, you know, five alignment, Joe Burrow and the same five offensive players. I mean, I, I don't know all their names, but it was one, two, six, 22 and 81. Like I can tell you those five guys were on the field for them, the majority of their snaps. And they lined up in a ton of different formations with those guys. And so one of the one of the things that those one of the boxes those guys had to really check was versatility. Um, and, you know, they, they lined up inside, they played slot, they played outside receiver. Um, and so they, they were really able to kind of move those chess pieces around in a way that was always difficult for the defense to adjust to. And they did a great job 
of you know creating mismatches for those guys. Um, they would go empty. They'd put the, the running back at the furthest wide receiver on one side and the tight end on the other side, which first of all, that's going to be kind of a man zone determinant for you right there. Um, you know, it, obviously if it's man, then they'll put a, a linebacker out on the running back in the tight end. If it's, if it's zone, they'll just have a corner out there. Um, and if it's zone, then you're probably going to work a mismatch with, with, you know, a linebacker or an overhang or a nickel kind of inside, um, with one of those receivers. So, you know, I was really impressed with his releases. Um, I thought he did a great job. Um, obviously LSU's done a, a great job working with their receivers and kind of transitioning to a more open spread style offense. Um, and I thought that, you know, obviously Joe Burrow is a stud and I think that he should be the number one overall pick. And I'm, you know, I'm not a scout and I'm saying that cause he's a freak. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think, I think Jefferson in particular did a really great job working his releases and, you know, w- releases and creating space at the line. And, you know, I think it's something that really translates well to the, to the pro level. Now, not sure if you'd be able to actually answer this question, mm-hmm. but having watched Justin Jefferson about, about what would you have pegged him at from tape for in his 40 time about what speed would you think? Um, I would have, I, and I don't actually don't know what his 40 time was. So I could be like bang (laughs) on the head here. I could be way off. Um, I would have said probably late four, four is probably like a four, four, eight or four, four, seven. All right. I was actually wondering because he ran a four, four, three, which that exceeded my expectations a little bit. Not much. I had him. I think it was a four, four, six is what I had him at. So I was just kind of curious about where you would have had him at. Now, the cream of the crop in this class, in my opinion, is CD Lamb. And I know we talked about him. And uh, you can go ahead and repeat what you told me before we went live about basically your notes on CD Lamb. So go ahead. Yeah. Oh yeah. My notes were basically just really good at football. Like, <laughs> you know, there's, there's only so much you can kind of say sometimes like he's, he's a good football player. Like don't know what you want from me. Um, you know, and I think, you know, coming from an air raid offense, you talk about having, you know, to getting to work with great talent at quarterback, obviously over the th- last three years, he's been blessed with three really remarkable quarterbacks. Um, you know, all three who had phenomenal college careers and I think hopefully who will all go on to have really successful NFL careers, you know, Baker Mayfield, you know, electric player. Um, I'm going to, uh, the kid who went to Arizona, Kyler Murray, um, you know, great, great player. Jalen Hurts, maybe one of the best college quarterbacks we've ever seen. Um, but, you know, I think he's, he's had success with all three. And I think, you know, for, for him, he's another kind of guy who you can use in a lot of different ways. Um, I think really of the receivers I've watched in this year's class, the kind of big buzzword for me and the thing I'm seeing with them is versatility. You know, that he's played inside. He's played outside. Um, they'll jet motion him and they'll use him as the kind of the mesh guy and they're running power read. Like, you know, he's a guy who you, know, you can do a lot of things with. I think he's capable of doing, you know certainly kind of advanced things. Um, I'm, I'm an air raid coach. I come from an air raid background and kind of my offensive mentality and the way I look at the game. Um, You know, people will say, Oh, he's, he's, you know, an air raid wide receiver. He has a different route tree. Yeah. He runs a different route tree, but I think it's the way the NFL is progressing. And you've seen, you know, a very successful spread air raid coach in Cliff Kingsbury get hired into the NFL. Um, You know, he ran comebacks. He ran your shallow crosses. Um, You know, I think he's a willing and capable mesh runner and, you know, when you're running mesh, which sometimes, you know, honestly, when you run mesh, you're going to get hit. You know, that's it's a big boy route because you're going to go across the middle and there are going to be dudes waiting across the middle to knock you off your feet. Um, and he ran it. You know, he was strong in the way he ran it. He was certainly capable. There are guys who are going to kind of tiptoe across that across that route. Um, I think he ran it really confidently. And I think that, you know, that tells me a lot about a guy and the way that he kind of approaches the route and the, the way he approaches a play. Yeah, and one thing that you mentioned about when talking about C.D. Lamb is versatility, and that actually brings me to this. Brian Greenfield, he comes in with another $5 donation, which thank you again, Brian, much appreciated. And he says, why is everyone saying we need a speed wide receiver instead of wide receiver like Sutton? I'd feel good with two Suttons on a team. How could that be a bad thing? Well, Luke had the buzzword with versatility is you kind of want a versatile versatile group set with your, your receiver core instead of guys who bring a lot of the same thing. And when you look at high-powered offenses over the last few years. You look at the Denver Broncos in 2013 with what they had with Wes Welker, Demarius Thomas, and Eric Decker. They brought a little bit of a variance with their skill set. Even the Kansas City Chiefs this last year, everybody's focusing on the speed, which, yes, Tyreek Hill does bring a lot of speed. McCool Hardman brings speed. But that wasn't all they brought. They brought complementary skill sets that Travis Kelsey fit in there perfectly. So it's 
that's what you're looking for. You're looking for versatile skill sets. Having two sons really isn't a bad thing, but it's just kind of limiting to the offense and just it's just limits what you can really do and how you can open up the playbook a little bit. I'll, I'll throw this out there as a D three football coach. If I got one court and Cortland study out, I would be very, very happy. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and you know, it is different skill sets. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that's amazing about wide receiver is there's so many different skill sets and there's so many ways to win. And you'll have guys who are just faster than the DB. Um, you know, I had, I had a freshman this year who started six games for us. Um, he was, you know, one of our best receivers this year, led our team in touchdowns. Like, he, I literally, like, I taught him different releases, and I'm going to continue to teach him different releases. He ran speed release all year. Like, <laughs> you know, your single release is when you kind of come to balance and then, like, give a head shake before you release. Speed release is when you just run fast. And he was faster than everybody else. <laughs> and, like, you know, that's fine. Like, you don't always have to win with, you know, all these different kind of releases and moves at the line. Like, you'll have that. You'll have your taller guys who just kind of out-physical their opponents. You know, there's there's all these different ways to win, it, 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 you know, kind of in space. Um, you know, that's, that's one of the most exciting things to me about being a receiver's coach is honestly that, you know, everything happens in so much space that you have to be an athlete to, to operate in space to kind of have that room to work with. Yeah, and when you're talking about that, um, Nick Kendall, he actually tweeted something out a, I think it was yesterday that wide receivers aren't always equal to other wide receivers. Like yeah. when you're talking, talking about famous ones in history, Randy Moss type receiver, isn't the same thing as a Wes Welker type receivers. So it's again, it's all that versatile skill sets and just the things that you can do with that versatility in an offense is outstanding. And going back to CD lamb and just talking to, and continuing to talk about him. There's, if there was one, like one concern that maybe even if it's just the slightest thing that you have to nitpick at, what what would it be for you? Because for me, if I had that one thing to nitpick, is that he just doesn't have elite speed, and that is something yeah. that in any kind of offense you can you can be fine with with the skill set that he brings. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I I think that's certainly think something you could nitpick. Um, you know, if I was going to be really really nitpicky, I think his hand placement could be better against press coverage, like. We're, we're really kind of just taking a scalpel to the knit and just trying to drill down to whatever's inside at that point. Yeah. Like you're, 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 you're rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Like he can play. I think he's going to be a fine professional football player. Yeah. And going on to the last few receivers that we have talking that we're going to be talking about, we got to get this guy out of the way. Bronco fans, they want him so badly with Denver. He ran a four, two, eight, 40 time Henry Ruggs out of Alabama what what are your thoughts on him? Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> like, if you look at the first six lines of my notes here, world-class speed, but that's obvious. You know, <laughs> like, you know, it's something that really jumps out at you when you watch him. Like, he's, he's, he's fast and, you know, kind of similar to my freshman receiver I was talking about. You know, I'd like to see him be a little bit better with his hands against press coverage, I guess, again, similar to CeeDee Lamb. Like, I think he, he, his speed will translate. He's got game-changing, game-breaking speed. I think kind of as a result, you see he has a great speed release. Like he doesn't have to always work these moves because 10 times out of 10, he's going to be faster than the guy across from him again in a straight line across 40 yards. Um, You know, I don't necessarily love his footwork at the line. Um, I don't like, I think he can do a little bit better to kind of improve his technique against press coverage. Um, He adjusts really well to the ball. One thing, one thing that I will kind of pick with in terms of, picking nets with him um a lot of times you'll hear receivers coaches talk about what's called the red line um basically the red line is this imaginary line that's drawn between the bottom of the numbers and the sideline um and when you're releasing outside you want to keep the red line because that allows your quarterback space to throw towards the sideline so that you can always fade back towards the ball but you want to give your quarterback some space to place the ball into. Um, that's one thing I think he he has issues kind of being rerouted sometimes, that he gives up a little bit too much and he'll be a little bit outside that red line, which doesn't give your quarterback as much room as you would like. Um, so that's ab- absolutely something that I would, you know, I would imagine that the NFL has watched that and identified that. And, you know, a lot of practice fields, especially at the college level, will have a painted in red line on the field that they can say, hey, you're outside this, get back in. <laughs> Now, one of my big concerns with Ruggs is that watching his routes, and I am in no shape or form an expert on wide receiver. That is probably one of the positions I'm worst at. That and quarterback. Cornerback, I mean, uh, just 
not not my best work there. Is I'm definitely a guy in the trenches, defensive line, offensive line, linebackers, edges. No that, that's that's my place. Now, with watching Rugs, one of my big concerns with him is that his routes he seems to not necessarily go 100% speed throughout his whole route, but he doesn't always throttle down. He may not. He may start out 80% and then come out of a break and hit that 100%. But there's just no speed, much speed variation. What what are, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I think that's kind of that's a feel thing as much as anything when it comes to playing the wide receiver position. Um, you know, I think, and we'll, we'll kind of talk about this in a sec. But you know, Jerry Judy does a great job of setting up his moves in advance. Um, and I think so much of being a wide receiver is about feel and about you know, it, it sometimes it comes down to as simple as when you're when you're running a dig and you get up to like just kind of when you're running at the safety and I'm going this way and he like you don't want him to know you're going that way and it's just you kind of hesitate give a head stick this way stick and you're gone that way like so much of it you know wide receivers who are really skilled at route running can use little subtle things in their body that it's just like if you've got a db we'd use this term stacked um where say it's it's one-on-one it's man coverage you've beaten him off the line and you're you're past him right he's stacked you you put him in your you you use the term you put him in your back pocket right he's behind you He's at a significant disadvantage right now because whatever you do, he's got to react to and he can't really anticipate it. You know, if you're if you're running, you've got your red line, right? We just talked about that. <laughs> and, you know, you want to give kind of a, just a head and a, kind of a slight stick to the corner and then break to the post. You know, it's those little subtle things about route running that it's, you know, those nuances can take some time to develop. Um, and especially when you've got, what was it, 428 speed. You know, I think not only the body positioning and the way you move your head or kind of dip a shoulder and things like that, but especially kind of as you refine it, that you kind of slow down your speed and then accelerate into things like that can also help. Yeah, I definitely I definitely agree with that. And you brought him up, so let's just go to him. The Alabama teammate, the Alabama, well, it's more like a quad quadruplet with that receiver core with Jalen Waddle and Devontae Smith as well. But let's go to the other receiver that's actually in this draft class with Jerry Judy. I mean, just giving a quick take on mine. I mean, this guy's routes are fantastic. That's going to be how he makes yeah. his life in the NFL as soon as route running and just can be that reliable guy for a quarterback. But you're the receiver guy, not trying to take away from you. So I'll let you go ahead and let's give let's hear your thoughts about Jerry Judy. Yeah. And I think, you know, as opposed to the LSU offense where they had roles, they certainly were kind of, you know, that they, they did this and, you know, in a certain formation, they would line up this way. Um, they, they had some versatility into kind of what they were asked to do. Um, Jerry, Judy, Henry Ruggs, like you could tell there was a little bit more refinement as to what their roles were. Um, Ruggs was more or less the speed guy. Um, and I think Jerry, Judy, as a result, was asked to run some more kind of complicated, like double, triple, you know, you can call it stem or double move routes um but i think you know that kind of was just more a byproduct of his offense and in terms of having five all world trench guys to kind of protect the quarterback um so you know i think what he was kind of do is you know asked to do is a little bit different from a henry ruggs kind of guy um i think he has great stems great moves um he like i was just talking about he uses his head so effectively in routes that he'll just kind of give that little nod or just kind of a duck and kind of uh, you know just impact a db just kind of cause and effect just a little bit um for them to kind of not necessarily you know anticipate where you're going um you know i think he's he's incredibly smooth he's incredibly polished um he's got good releases he wins with the speed release despite not being that fast of a guy um you know of of the guys i watched i think he's probably you know certainly someone that you'll hear the word pro ready thrown about um, because he's really polished all around he's got you know he's got some rough edges to his game and again you know i'm a d3 receivers coach i'm not i'm not going to challenge an alabama receivers coach on what he needs to be a lot better at but you know he's got those little rough edges that i think you can polish up um i think the red line is kind of another one of those that he just gives up a little bit too much room outside you know when you have two guys on the same offense doing that thing you kind of have to pause and ask yourself, okay, is this something that's now kind of being coached a little bit? Um, so, you know, I think that that's something you'd like to refine for him coming to the NFL, but it might be something that he's given a little bit of liberty, a little bit of freedom with at the college level. Yeah, and since we covered Judy, I'll just go to this. Brian Greenfield comes in with yet another $5 donation. Again, thank you, Brian. We appreciate that so much. And he asks, would you guys take another receiver outside of Judy or Lamb over Ruggs 
and for me personally, is those are my top three receivers right there. If J- Lamb and Judy aren't there at 15, then I would be taking Ruggs. If that's the way that we're going to go, of course, obviously depends on who else is there. I wouldn't take Ruggs over a Tristan Werps, but if that's the best receiver, that's the best player on the board, I'd go Ruggs. There's no other receiver that I have higher than him at this point. Basically, LaVisca Chenault, his injury concerns have dropped me a little bit, especially with him dealing with the groin injury. So there's no other receiver that would be taken over Ruggs at 15 at this point. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. Yeah, and I think so much of that depends, too, on, you know, what are you looking for in your offense? Who do you have on the roster? You know, is a guy who's a bit more of a chess piece as opposed to just a speed, you know, a speed item. Like, you know, what do you need? Do you need offensive linemen? Do you need receiver? I think all of that is a balance. And, you know, I, I don't I don't necessarily know if I'm in a great position to say just because <laughs> I haven't watched everybody in the class, you know, to say take this person over this person or anything like that. But, you know, I think all three are going to have really strong pro careers, um, you know, maybe some developing a little bit sooner than others. Um, and, you know, uh, Alabama is is a hotbed of talent, and you know they've had some great receivers go on and have some great success in the league. And you know, the, I don't think it's fair to compare those guys straight up, you know, head up to, you know, Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley, anything like that. But you know, th- the school has put together some 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 okay wide receivers, huh? They've put, <laughs> put together some nice guys. So. All right, guys, there's one more receiver that we want to talk about before we get around to taking your questions. And uh, I see the Mala Heddle is coming in with the Denzel Mims, that is all. And uh, that's actually the last receiver we're going to be talking about. I actually made you uh, made you watch up on him before we went live a little bit just because of the combine he had. Tremendous yeah. combine, outstanding. So just some quick thoughts about Denzel Mims before we get to taking some questions. Yeah, and I think you know, kind of similar, to, similarly to some of the the air raid things. Again, I'm an air raid guy, so I'm never going to set up here and tell you <laughs> the air raid is not the way to go. Um, but you know, I think you've seen enough quarterbacks translate really well to the to the NFL out of the air raid, and I think that the kind of um, that there's some you know some I don't know what the word is not misgivings or anything like that about about air raid quarterbacks. But I think that they've done a great job of kind of removing that bias about air raid quarterbacks. And I think we're starting to see the same for air raid receivers. Um, You know, he, I think, has had some issues with getting rerouted, Um, you know, for being a big guy. I'd like to see him be more physical. Um, I'd like to see him kind of dominate against press coverage a little bit more. Um, like he's, he's obviously a strong blocker. And I understand from you that he's talked about his willingness and his, his love of getting to block, which is, which is what you look for in a receiver. Um, you know, he's, he's, again, he's a really smooth route runner, especially for a guy kind of that big, you know, it's, it's great when you have kind of just a guy who really transitions well from a release into his initial stem to a break to second stem, anything like that. Now, one thing with Denzel Mims is at one point he used to be my a big sleeper of mine. A lot of ton, a lot of the conversation based around him going somewhere day three. I think it's very safe to say after the senior bowl he had where he absolutely killed it and the combine again where he absolutely killed it. I think that we've reached that point where round one isn't out of the conversation because his tape is really strong and what he did there just added a lot of added a lot more to it. But Evan McKinley comes in with a four dollar and 99 cent donation thank you evan much appreciated as we appreciate all donations you guys give us i mean just means a lot to us and it says if all position needs are gone at 15 one mock i traded back to seattle's pick gained a second would you grab justin jefferson denzel mims or jalen rager and is that a good move well we spent some time talking about the receivers to start the show and so i'm actually really curious about this i know that you're not so in in tune with where these players would go yeah. but all three of these guys are getting talked about as late first round, early second round picks. So just so, just so you are aware, if you had to pick one for the Broncos with what you do know about Denver, which one would you which one would you take? That's a great question, um, and I think I, I guess let me kind of come at this from this direction. I think that there are very good reasons that you can pound the table for each one of those guys. Um, for Justin Jefferson, you can pound the table for his versatility. You can kind of play him in a lot of different places. Um, I think he's going to contribute for you early because he's he's ready to. Um, you know, he's faced big stages. He's faced the national championship. Um, he's had a pro level quarterback throwing him the ball already. Like he's going to fit right in just fine. Um, you know, Denzel Mims. He's a big guy. Obviously, he's an athlete. You know, he's maybe not as refined as you would like just yet for an NFL receiver. If I'm a if I'm a wide receivers coach, 
that's fine. I'm going to gamble on myself. I'm going to say, hey, give me this guy. I've seen what he can do. He's an athlete. Like, I will coach him up. I'll get him better. Um, and, you know, if you have the right personnel in place, then I think that's an absolute, absolute thing that you can do is just say, hey, this guy's maybe not there. We're gambling on his ceiling. We're going to take him. Um, and then obviously Rager, you know, he's he's a freak with the ball in his hands. Like, you know, sure, the combine maybe necessarily didn't kind of, you know, it, it kind of raised some some issues, maybe raised some questions about him. Um, but, you know, with the ball in his hands, he's he's a force to be reckoned with. He's special in open space. Um, and so for me, I, you know, like we just talked about, there's so many different models of success for a wide receiver. And there's so many different ways you can kind of find success and find guys who are going to win at the next level for you. Um, do I need, you know, if, if it's a question of do I need a guy who's going to play right away, I'll take Jefferson. Do I need a guy to in, kind of inject some X factor into the into the offense? I'm going to take a Rager. Or if I have some room to kind of develop a guy who doesn't necessarily need it to necessarily need to be ready to go day one then i'm going to take a mims i'm going to gamble on the development of the team i'm going to gamble on having years of him working with um with a young quarterback and drew lock and having having them develop some consistency together yeah and i'm going to come back to this i just want to say guys that we are running a little bit long so we don't have that much longer in time for being able to take your questions so if you guys have them in get them in now i do want to voice my opinion about this though and basically from a bronco standpoint being a analyst of the broncos and the senior draft analyst for the draft when it comes to mile huddle is at this rate i think i would actually probably lean justin jefferson luke kind of hit the nail on the head a little bit about needing a guy who can come in and kind of compete right away and that's justin jefferson and while they do need an x factor that does make me kind of want to take jalen rager but I'm looking at Justin Jefferson. I think he can be a tremendous compliment to Colin Sutton and bring and just bring a lot to the offense. And he can try and get that X factor at another point. And Buana Beast, who is actually a good friend of the show, often commenter on MMH and everything like that. And he comes in and asks, is head movement something a wide receiver can use to make more effective double moves? I'll let you take this one. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the, there's there's a there's a there's a term in, in kind of wide receiver coaching that's called a rocker step. Um, which is basically, you know, if I'm if I'm running what's called a corner post, um, you know, that you're you're breaking first to the corner and then to the post, right? So if I'm if, again, if I'm eventually going this way, when I kind of run, I'm you know getting to my depth where I break the route. See, I'm kind of airplaning here. I should be kind of down here, right? Staying consistent with body posture the whole time. I'm going to plant my plant my inside foot here. I'm going to break to the corner and I'm going to flip my head and shoulders just because that's going to give the impression, hey, this guy's going to the corner, right? He's breaking hard here. Break to the corner, heads here, and then again with the same body posture, take one or two, pretty much one kind of bang, two, three, bang, and then break back to the post is what's called the rocker step. Um, so, yeah, head, head movement with that is so effective because if you have a guy who's always going here and his head is always going here, he's bang to the corner, but his head's still there, and then he's back, you know, that's not going to sell it nearly as much. Um, as you know, a really effective head, head kind of head fake will. All right. And then just as a courtesy to Nick, cause he's asking us about it. All right. You watch these five, six receivers. Sorry. Um, and we can throw in LaVisca in here. How about we give you your, you give us your quick rankings of them. Uh, okay. From having not ranked them and from just scrolling through my notes. <laughs> Um, this is what you're going to get. If I, if I had to walk in tomorrow and start coaching these guys, um, I would go Judy, Lamb, Ruggs, Rager, Mims, I think. Oh, I'm forgetting Jefferson, aren't I? Uh, yeah. um, <laughs> Man, and like again, they all win in different ways. I would probably stick. Min, I would stick him. I would stick Jefferson ahead of Mims. I think. So basically, Judy Lamb, Rugs, Rager, Jefferson, Mims, and where would you put Lavisca? Oh my God! Stop! You're asking me to do these <laughs> things now. Um, I well, you, you know, again, if you're gambling on if you're gambling on his injury, if you're gambling on him being available to you, then I think you got to put him after Rugs. Um, because I think he's a guy who's going to be able to contribute immediately, and he's he's a great athlete, and I think he's going to give you a lot of options. All right, I can, I can actually, this to me, man, you got to stop doing this to me. <laughs> I, I'm actually not that much in disagreement. I mean, Lamb is my number one, Judy's my number two, and 
there was a lot of positive subs coming about uh, coming out from Lavisca's injuries and saying that it was he was more missing games due to just concern about long term damage and making them worse instead of him not actually being able to play. But that groin injury made me concerned, so he actually was my number three. He's now dropped a little bit after that groin injury, and Rugs is now my number three. And then Rager, Jefferson, Mims. That's pretty much that falls pretty well in line with what I have. And just going back real quick, because there's something you said that I wanted to address earlier about with Mims about betting on yourself as a coach to be able to coach them up. There's a lot of things. This is something that fans often don't take into the consideration. There are a lot of NFL coaches that they will bet on the athletic player and their ability to coach them up. We've seen that time and time again in the NFL draft guys with athletic ability going super high because coaches there's, there's arrogance in a coach with about their abilities. They think they're, that they're the greatest coach ever and that they're going to be able to get the, get the most out of the guy. So th- that's something that has to be considered in and factored in with everything. I'm, I'm also going to push back on that a little bit as a coach. It's not necessarily <laughs> arrogant, but if I see a shiny new toy, I'm going to want to play with it. Yeah. Like, you know, do I want to – would I, in a conceivable universe, want to coach any one of those seven guys? The answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> Give me all of them. And uh, Terry Randall comes in with a $5 donation. Thank you for that, Randall. Again, much appreciated as we appreciate it every donation you guys give us. And Brian Greenfield comes in with another $5 donation. He goes, only wide receiver I'd trade up a couple spots for is CD. Any other players would be would be worth realistically to give up a third. Um, only There's only two players in this class that I might be willing to move up for. And I'm a big proponent of, well, very anti-trading up. I don't think that there's the value in it. Basically, hardly ever. But I kind of agree with CD Lamb if that's the way you want to go. If you want to go to receiver, he is the one that I would move up for. But Tristan Wirfs is another player that I'd be willing to move up, move up for. And if he manages to fall just even slightly, well, two guys actually, Derek Brown, the defensive lineman out of Auburn, if he manages to fall. And <laughs> Nick's going to grow me for this because I can never say his name right. Jeffrey Okuda, the cornerback out of Ohio State. I, somehow I always pronounce it wrong. I hear it correctly, but it just comes out wrong. I'm terrible with pronouncing names. But I'd move up for him, too. Uh, those are the only guys that I'd even consider it for. But even then, I'm very anti-moving up. I don't. I just don't think it's hardly ever worth it. Can, can I just throw in a note in on, on CD? Like, you know, as, as a guy who's a huge fan of football and of really good football games, I think there's something to be said for guys having um, having great – great performances and on big on big stages um and kind of one of the big games that really cemented cd lamb as being a, a really good football player for me was you know um oklahoma georgia in the rose bowl a couple of years ago in that amazing overtime game um and he kind of like he came out and he shone like he really took and took the advantage of having a big stage and of having the opportunity to kind of succeed on that big stage um, and it's, I, I, again, it's not like he was, you know, languishing in the shadows and they just pulled him out and dusted it off and said, you know, this Velociraptor will do just fine today. Like he's obviously already an athletic freak. Um, but you know, it, it's kind of similar to a guy like T Higgins for Clemson, who just absolutely shredded things in the college playoff last year. Um, you know, guys, guys like that who kind of come and take advantage of big stages, you know, the moment's not too big for them. You know, they'll absolutely be able to succeed in, in the NFL because, you know, in some cases they might be playing in front of smaller crowds or, you know, less vociferous crowds. You know, I, you can say what you want about SEC football and, you know, not running the ball and all that. But let me tell you, they get loud. They get, they get rowdy. <laughs> Those are some pretty loud crowds. All right, guys, this is the last call for questions. I do see two more that I do want to take before this, but if there's any others, then now's the time to get them in. But the first question that I want to take is Miller707 Champ. It goes, what's your opinion on Michael Pittman? I don't, I'm not sure if you've done any work on him, a USC receiver. he's For me, he's a bigger receiver, uh, not, ex- not a carbon copy of Cortland Sutton, but very similar to him with how he plays the game and everything. And if Denver needed that, I'd be all for him, but – I like the player. I wish him nothing but the best in the NFL. I think that he will actually have a very solid career, but he needs to go to the right team that can utilize his skill set and fit that in to what they need at the receiver core. Yeah. I haven't watched hardly any of him. Um, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, he shredded Colorado at one point this past year. I think I was watching that game and I was like, Hmm, this guy's a problem. Um, So, I mean, I remember him doing things that I thought really highly of in terms of technique, um, but I don't, I couldn't tell you a whole lot more apart from that. 
And then the other question is from Brian Greenfield, and he asks, how many receivers do you think guys go in the first round, and what steal away wide receiver in the second round? Well, this is a little bit hard one to to answer because right now, after the combine, after watching what Jalen Rager did, there's been a lot of conversations I've had that are kind of iffy on where he goes. A lot of people are saying that he's still a first-round guy, but there's been quite a few guys who have also mentioned that they think he falls out of that first round now. So... I think that we are we see at least five receivers go in the first round, and if Jalen Rager J, or Jalen Rager, sorry, or um, Denzel Mims happens to fall to forty six, I think that those guys can be a tremendous deal for the Denver Broncos or any team that drafts them. And then Brandon Nayok out of Arizona State is another receiver that I think could be a tremendous deal. And uh, one last name is Donovan Peoples Jones. I was kind of low on him after watching what he did with at Michigan this last year, but the dude's athletic and he, he was probably the receiver that was hurt the second most by absolutely abysmal quarterback play right behind Jalen Rager. He dealt with terrible quarterback play and he still managed to be pretty impressive. Yeah. And that's the same thing we, we kind of talked about with Denzel Mims is, um, you know, uh, you know, you, you kind of gamble on the upside of a, of a player's athletic ability. And, you know, I think, I think I would imagine a very key element of that is the interviews at the combine that you sit a guy down and you get him on the board because if you're drafting a freak, you know, an athletic freak, then you want to be able to say, okay, this guy's coachable or you talk to his coach or, you know, you look at what he's doing on the field and you can say, well, I can tell that he's learned how to do that. Like that's, that's, he's learned that that's coachability right there. Um, you know, I, I just tried to Google and Google didn't tell me this. I was trying to find out what the most receivers that's ever been drafted in the first round is. Um, I'd imagine it's probably in the in the neighborhood of five or six. I think so. And uh, here's one thing about this is I can't remember which one. One of the ESPN guys projected, I think it was like 29 receivers to go in the first three rounds. And I think the high is like 16. Yeah, that's it just that's, I, that's, I, I, that's a stretch. I don't think 29 go, but I have, I think it's, I have 19 in my top 100 players. Like this receiver class is ridiculous. And, and go ahead. Oh, sorry. As a, as, even as a wide receivers coach, I wouldn't take a wide receiver on average every three picks. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty outrageous. And Rahel Nagatu comes in and who will the Redskins draft? Please be good since I'm a Redskins fan. I think in the end, the Redskins walk away with Chase Young. Getting that edge rusher is such a valuable part of any defense, any any football team. You got to have that guy to go get after the quarterback, and he's the best one in this class. To me, he's the best player in the class. But obviously, Joe Burrow, the Bengals. That's that's. I think you can be pretty confident in writing that down in Sharpie that that's going to happen. And I like Chase Young. I'm not buying this quarterback talk, but we never know. After watching what the Arizona Cardinals did with Josh Rosen to Kyler Murray, so who knows? New coach in town. Maybe they go that route, but I, I, in the end, again, I think it's going to be Chase Young. Yeah. And, you know, just to kind of step back real quick for a second, um, you know, if, if the most that's ever gone is five or six, we've talked about seven receivers tonight who I think are all, you know, effective receivers and who are all going to be able to contribute early. And, you know, I think it kind of depends if you're weighing those guys up as having a first round value or not. I think all, all seven of them are someone that I would absolutely take on a football team, you know, not knowing anything about the scheme or the, the talent in place or anything like that. But um, I think as a result, if, if they're available in the seventh or in the second round and I have some imagination that at least one of the seven will be available, I think any one of them would be a good get there. All right. And then last question we're going to take is from Brian Weatherwax. And he asks, thoughts on Lynn Bowden Jr. with one of our thirds could be a steal, multi-talented at different positions. I'm not sure if you're familiar with who with him, but he is a guy who he played quarterback, receiver, running back, return man, all this stuff for Kentucky. Super athletic freak. Oh, yeah. More, more athlete than football player at this point. Yeah. But this is one of those things that you kind of talked about early, earlier about betting on your ability to coach a player up. I like Lynn Bowden. I think that a third might be a little bit early. But with how athletic he is, who knows? It's with how teams can bet on themselves with taking those athletic players. It's hard to really gauge where he would go. But I think that he can. I think that it, with the right coach, he can end up having a very solid career as just a weapon for a team on yeah. offense and special teams. Number one, right for Kentucky? I Am think I the right guy. Yeah, 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 the big stocky guy. Yeah, I mean Kentucky is a team that is has been really successful recently of kind of moving guys around a little bit and you know putting them in good positions and you know I mean obviously they're the Wildcats but if if you're watching Wildcat formations in college football these days I think they're kind of one of your go tos that they do that really really successfully um, and I, if I'm not mistaken he's he I know he played quarterback but I thought he was a Wildcat quarterback before that if I'm not mistaken uh, yeah I think so yeah. 
So, yeah. And, you know, I think I think as a result, again, you're kind of betting on yourself, but it's it's a trend. You know, we, we saw the Jaguars do it a couple of years ago with, um, oh, my God, shoestring Denzel Robinson. Yes. Yeah. And they literally put him on the roster and gave him a brand new position designation of OW offensive. Yeah. Player. Like, <laughs> you know, em- embrace the change. It's coming. Yeah. All right, guys. But that's going to do it for us. Unfortunately, if you haven't noticed, Lance's Internet went out right when we got into this and he just thought that uh with his internet giving him problems that we probably won't be uh won't be best if he joins in and actually tg comes in with a late donation of 20 bucks very much appreciate that as we appreciate all donations you guys give us man thank you so much he goes i agree with you trickle those are only the only guys i trade up for well thank you i like when people agree with me it means a lot but uh, i will yeah. So I can say that much. <laughs> it's nice when people agree with me because my colleagues at Mile Huddle often don't. So I don't know what it is. There's something wrong with them. But uh, anyways, it's been a it's been a wonderful show having you on, Luke. Man, it's uh, just I mean you're such a good friend and everything like that, and we definitely miss you here at Mile High Huddle. But we're glad you're on to bigger and better things with coaching college football and uh, being able to get your insights. And hopefully, the people watching this were able to learn a little bit more about it. I mean, some of the stuff that you were teaching was just and just Sharon was just a tremendous thing that just regular fans can take away from. So thank you so much for joining me guys. Just so you know, next week we will have another guest on and uh, he did a mock draft, a community mock draft with the draft network. And he's going to be coming in and he's going to be talking about that draft and how things felt, how things happened and fell and everything like that. And the, and the picks that he made for the Denver Broncos, obviously it's going to be after the combine. And this was, I think it was done in early February. So there's going to be a lot of changes to it. And, but we figured that would be a very interesting lesson for you guys hearing about somebody who's not part of the mile. Huddle staff and their mock draft. So hopefully you guys tune in for that again. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you, Luke, for joining me and please everyone have a wonderful night and stay safe out there. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.